The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Kev, you've changed. Have you, I? You've become the, the, the commercial Kev now. <laughs> you were spotted. Anything for a dollar. You, you were spotted the other day making pictures of paint pots in a shop. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I had to go to Mansfield. It's do you not, know where Mansfield is? I do know where Mansfield is, yeah. Mansfield is next to the end of the world. No, it's not. There's a world above Mansfield as well, Kev. No, no well, there is. If no. there is, then it's like a billion miles away. Well, from, from Malmesbury, but what time did you start? I had to be there at 7 a.m. Yeah. for a new store opening to take some pictures of pots of paint and some shop windows. And it's it's the best part of a three-hour drive from me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's it was actually only a couple of hours' work, but I had to hang around for about six hours because some fella parked his white van in front of the shop. Sounds like a decorator. Was he a decorator? Yeah, it does sound like a decorator. It sounds like a decorator <laughs> that used a decorator's shop yeah. for free parking and then went into town. <laughs> to do his shopping, yeah. yeah. Oh, dear. Well, do you, do you think you might do more of this uh, this kind of work? I mean, you you you're used to working with people, of course, and uh, this is sort of a or for a photographer a, 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 a branching out. Kev, uh, the paint pots didn't argue back. They didn't say get my best side, did they? No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, it was you know, it was no stress work. It's all right, you know, yeah. a day's worth of commercial work. I, I'm quite happy with that. You you sit in your car for three hours, listen to your audio book, yeah, take a few pictures, <laughs> sit back in your car listen to your audio book, and then just upload the, the JPEGs at the end of the day. And that Bob was it. And, and Bob's dead. The yeah. Fuji cast. Job done, I'd say. Mm. Bring more of those on. Yeah, so, uh, very yeah. rock and roll, but yeah. there you go. Well, no, it's not very rock and roll. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know. Well, for people that work in the industry, Kev, it's very rock and roll. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm happy to do it. Now, well, welcome along to the uh, Fuji cast. Uh, another week of you and your questions from our electronic mailbag and, of course, also through the Fuji cast private Facebook group, which we'll have a little word about in a moment that you're very welcome to become a part of. Send your questions either via that, and Kev reads those ones out, or, or you can send them to click at fujicast.co.uk and uh, we get the emails and I read the emails out. Kev, Kevin in his bunker in Malmesbury with a Facebook, me here with a with the emails. If you're not a Fujifilm shooter, don't worry. It's a very big community, and whatever flavour you shoot, you're very welcome. Even you, Tony, with your Canon. Thank you to those of our friends who have uh, now supported us on Patreon, which, for the price of a coffee, keeps the show growing and going. And if you're one of our patrons, of course, you'll you'll get bumped to the front with your questions. Kev's book of the week this week is... Oh, um, I know we're, we're all over the kind of pandemic stuff and pandemic books and all that kind of stuff, yeah. but I've got, uh, I've got quite an interesting one, actually. It's, it's simply called Wear a Mask. Wear a uh, Mask? By Martin Stott. Yeah, ah, I'll okay. explain more when we get to it. It's right. very straightforward, but actually quite interesting. And we'll have part two of Ask Andreas. There was no way we could make that just one single part. It had to be a two-parter. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, he's he's coming up soon as well with um, with all the questions that uh, that you asked. I know that there were a few that were left over in the end, um, but uh, we've saved them up. We're going to do something with those uh, another week. And of course, ask Andre. Well, Andreas will come back, won't he, at some stage? Yeah, of course he will. And I did suggest we'd like to, uh, you know, when we're allowed to go out to play with more than five or ten people, which well, I know we're allowed to, but it's it's still we're still sort of shying away from. A kind of two hundredth birthday event at the moment, aren't we? We're sort of yeah, we are. We're just holding back a little yeah. bit. Although I'm going to use, I'm at the photography show on uh, a week uh, next Saturday and Sunday. So um, if you're around, folks, come to the Future Film Store stand, stand, store, stand, stand, store. They'll probably sell you things as well. <laughs> um, I'll be doing a talk on Saturday and Sunday, uh, along with all the other Future Film ex-photographer so i'm kind of going to use that as a as a test bed to see you know roughly you know how many people how many people are going to tps will right. be a good guide to you know the confidence in in large mass gatherings yeah, of photographers point. inside good point yeah <laughs> there's been quite a lot of positive noise made about the event i i keep seeing things people saying yeah i'm going to be there what day are you there yeah so i'm seeing positive yeah. stuff yeah 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 no absolutely but you know the proof being the pudding i mean yeah. normally saturday at the photography show, you know, at half nine when it opens or ten o'clock or whatever, yeah. it's it's rammed. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get that wave, that first wave. It's really yeah. funny because usually I'm inside at that point, um, and you can see all of the uh, the stand, the people who are manning the stands all around the place, kind of look, having a nice little yeah. friendly coffee and yeah. chat with the people yeah. next door. And then, and then this this <laughs> bit, the bell goes. Yeah. The bell goes. It's, it's a bit like, God, uh, like a you know the stock exchange. The oh, bell right. goes. Okay. 
and then the doors open, and then this this kind of wave of people. But you're, but you're <laughs> okay because 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 you watch it all from your executive dressing room with your. That's right. Yeah. Red just, M- I'm usually just having my makeup done about red, then. Yeah. yeah, red M and M's, and what yeah. else do you have on your rider? I must have red M and M's. Um, what else would what what would be on the Mullins rider? Oh, anything alcoholic. I don't care, frankly. <laughs> Not before yeah. you go on stage, Kev. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It's the best time for it. Kill the nerves. <laughs> you know that's that's the that's the attitude we have when we go flying, Kev. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? <laughs> anything to do with nerves, alcohol. Be- so that's why clock. I have alcohol before I get up in the morning because I get nervous. <laughs> oh, Kev. It's why I have alcohol <laughs> just before I have my first coffee because you know I get nervous about coffee. Yeah, yeah. we need to alcohol. have we need to have a chat. Actually, I haven't had any drink no. for a while. Are you off the pop? A little bit, yeah. Mm-hmm. Just kind of, um, I'm back in judo and stuff now, so yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying not to be the fat old man in the corner of the mat. Oh, Kev, you're never the fat old man on the mat. <laughs> um, there was, uh, let me mention Facebook quickly in this Tony Northrup thing. He made a, he made a, a film, didn't he, about, um, the, the uh, what did he title it? The Truth About Fujifilm. Uh, the truth, according to Tony, obviously, it's all very subjective. And I, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm poised because in the film he made this uh, one, one of the adverts that he had um, for Squarespace was that he was talking about the merits, and he's right about this actually, the merits of having a, an email address that looks professional, that has your name and a, you know, a .dot com or .dot org or whatever you are. But he gave his email address, and I was, I was finger poised to say. How'd you fancy coming on to talk about some of the stuff that you've you've mooted? Now I did mention that within the thread of the Facebook uh, thread about this film that he's made, where he mm-hmm. purports to know the the future of of Fuji film and where they're headed uh, in in corporate fashion. And then I sort of stopped. And some people said yeah, and other people said no. I wouldn't waste your breath. Yeah, I, well, uh, you know <laughs> what? We're we're I'm I'm ambivalent to all of that kind of stuff. I think the the you know as long as both sides of the party are are open and honest, it doesn't yeah. matter what their opinions are. You know that's dem- democracy for you, isn't yeah. it? So yeah, I wouldn't be adverse to it. I don't think I've ever seen him on anything other than his own YouTube channel. Though, no, so. I'd probably say no anyway. To be fair, yeah, yeah, we probably just wouldn't reply to the email. Maybe. I mean, but that's we, a bit that's a bit unfair. He might do. I yeah. don't know. I met him once actually. Oh, was he nice? Yeah, he was nice in person. Yeah. Yeah, he used to work for Microsoft like I did. Oh, my God. How many people work for Microsoft, Kev? Oh, billion. Everybody works oh, for Microsoft. Well, we're, now we're all like chipped with it, aren't we? We all work for him now. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. right, yeah. If you've had the COVID vaccine. <laughs> yeah, you can have Windows 11 <laughs> pouring out of your eyeballs. <laughs> I know. It's amazing. I can do a Google search. Um, yeah. So, well, I was thinking about it, but but as you say, he may or may not reply. But the uh, just the, the thing I wanted to mention, Kev, um, was that... Um, in the thread, which got a bit juicy at times, just be a little bit careful about your language. Kev has a well, bleep. I don't know. Not you. Kev has, Kev has a bleep machine, but um, it's difficult to install a bleep machine in the thread of a Facebook. And I know we're all adults. Ah, I see. But it, it got it got a bit feisty at times. But it, I mean, it's good to have an opinion about it. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't read it. I think that might have been when I was taking pictures of paints of pot, pots of paint, <laughs> pots of paint. <laughs> God, tell me you weren't like this the other day. You'll never get another commercial job in your life. Uh, uh. It's been a week, I tell you. But, um, yeah, so the the only thing that I will say about the film is I, I, I felt, and a personal feeling here, that it was just a little bit patronising at times and that, that Fujifilm, I'm paraphrasing a lot here, but it was a kind of a suggestion that Fujifilm are very good at experience, which they are, and that's that's a fair comment, actually. They are good at experience, and... Uh, the experience of using a Fujifilm camera is very different to using, say, a Sony. And there's there's no doubt about that at all. Or a Canon or a Nikon. Yeah. But the the suggestion that, you know, Fujifilm might be better just to concentrate on making fancy um, sort of um, fa- fancy covers for their cameras to, to make them a bit more hipster or, um, you, you know, play on the poor man's Leica thing, I, I just found a bit patronising. Hmm. Yeah, well, I haven't read it, like I said, so I can't really, yeah. really comment. But, you know, he, he's made himself a business, and I would imagine that he does very well from his YouTube oh, channel. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, we can't knock him for that. But, yes, I'm not a big fan of purposefully conflictory content. 
Yeah. If that makes sense. No, you got there in the end. <laughs> um, yeah, that, I had to think very hard about putting those th- those letters together yeah. to make those two words. It has been a long couple of weeks for you, this, isn't oh, it? Oh, and it's getting longer. It's not even, I've got, uh, it's just like, uh, boom. It, when, once TPS is done, and yeah. I've got a wedding the day after TPS on a Monday. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> then I think I've got another two week weddings the weekend after. But yeah, it's, it kind of calms down a little bit after that. Um, I know what'll wake you up. <laughs> Have some money, Kev. Thank you. Yes, I'm very much awake now. <laughs> right, who's going to go first with questions? Um, I'll go. Why on not? Um, so, Facebook group, as always, I will start with the latest one, which was posted one day ago, and this is from Kirk Vogel. He says, What if Fujifilm disappeared tomorrow? I know I'd feel it and would be okay for some time with my current tools, but does anyone have a succession plan for their equipment? I know it's impossible to know what gear will be like in the future, or if indeed all we will need will be our phones, uh, which he puts in bracket, he highly doubts. Uh, anyone have any thoughts? You know, my, my take on that is if, you know, it's not going to happen, but if, let's just say Fujifilm did go bust tomorrow, it wouldn't mean their cameras would stop working. <laughs> They'd still no, be going. No, no. You know, you'd have plenty of time to, uh, you know, to think about things like that. And, you know, I, I kind of, the way that I see my camera systems is that each camera I buy, I expect to be using professionally, i.e., you know, still still going strong yeah. for four years now all of my cameras uh, all my Fujifilm cameras that i've ever owned are still working there's no I've n- none of them have ever had a sensor failure or i've never had to go back for any repairs or anything like that so they're all still going but you know in my mind when i, I bought the xt4 recently for example um and in my mind i expect that to still be you know still be xt4 in for me at weddings in in yeah. four years time so yeah you know you do what you do don't you it's the same as if uh I don't know if Microsoft went burst or Google went burst or Apple went oh, burst. Don't say Google. Yes. God, I've got if Apple went burst. Imagine that. Ooh, what a party. <laughs> Kev, just because it's not the flavour you use. But do you know what? I, I've been I've been developing a website recently for um, for rugby club and uh, I've been jumping through these incredible hoops because only the iPhone 11, none of the other iPhones, but only the iPhone 11 has this weird bug where yeah. on uh, you know it doesn't doesn't quite recognise the finger presses on the screen properly oh. for sub menus. Mm. And only in WordPress, of right. course. So I've had to get all of this jiggery pokery in place just to pacify iPhone 11 users. Um, it's been driving me absolutely. Well, that's nuts. clever stuff, though, Kev. You've been coding to get to to enable iPhone 11s to work on WordPress site. Yeah, on wow, this particular Kev. submenu system. You don't yeah, need and to be it's working as a thing. I mean, yeah. it's all over the internet. You know, oh, right, it's, okay. it's a real problem. Um, but it seems to be only on iPhone 11s for some reason. So oh, okay, yeah. but of course. A lot of people use iPhones 11, so you can't really ignore it. No. Here's one from, I think this is Marino. 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 M-R-I-N-A-L. Marino. Oh, no, it's Mike. (laughs) (laughs) What the fuck were you about? (laughs) Sorry. I was reading off his email, um, actual, his email name, which is not, (laughs) it's Mike. (laughs) Marino Gosh. Marino Gosh. But he's known as Mike. Right. Okay, let's just call him Mike. I like Mike. What's not to like? Do you remember that song? Probably not. Gents, splendid show. Now the proud owner of an X100V. One minor point robbing me of a simple life. I love the idea of this great little camera returning me to something akin to the simple golden analogue days. However, having to choose between sRGB and Adobe RGB is forcing me to choose for either screen or print only, unless I process the RAW, which I would... I'd like to escape from. And you can kind of understand that. I mean, one of the things that, that people talk about is the wonderful you know, JPEG processing colours, etc. And the fact that you're seeing in front of you what, what you know, the, the exposure, etc. You can, you can shoot JPEG. Might I put a word in for an option to choose sRGB plus Adobe RGB or sRGB plus TIFF? Or have I just missed a glaring point? Am I doing something wrong, Mike? You're not doing anything wrong. There is only one choice. You can only pick one. Um, I don't, in my mind, I don't see the point, the extra processing power and everything of having both. Although I'm not sure it would be inconceivable for them not to be able to do it. Mm. However, what I would say is most, all the print labs I use, um, none of them, none. I, I honestly cannot remember any time where I have been asked to supply ARGB images. Um, So even if you do shoot sRGB and you want to print, 
it's fine because the print labs and, and everybody will be able to deal with that. The Really, the ARGB stuff, I think, would be for very specific situations. Yeah. Perhaps if you're printing at home yourself on a very high-end plotter printer or something like that where it, it demands ARGB. So, yeah, I mean, I honestly, I know people do shoot ARGB and then convert later. I've never shot Adobe No, I, I don't see the point in it, I have no, to not, say. And you're right, all the printers I've worked with, all the album manufacturers, it's all SR. RGB. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, you've got to be in a very specific situation for that to, to be necessary. Um, that doesn't mean Mike's not in that situation. Of course, he may well be. You know, what I would do, if, if, if you have to have both, then shoot ARGB because you can convert ARGB to sRGB very simply. Um, Photoshop will do it, Lightroom will do it, all that kind of stuff. Mm. You just, when you do the export, you just say export as sRGB. Um, that's that's the way to do it. I, I, I don't think there's 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 a real argument for the uh, for the camera manufacturers to do both. I just think that's extra R and D and and you know computational power that they yeah. probably don't need. It's a very 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 niche area. I would yeah. have thought. Okay, um, you're, I've got a really good question coming up from Simon Blakesley. This is almost like a standby for a very important. It's a kind of I'll give you a warning warning. A very very different question from Simon Blakesley in a moment. Kev, go, go first, though, with your... Okay, one from Daniel Kiss. Right. Um, I want to be called Kiss. Do you? That would be great. What a great surname, Daniel Kiss. Hmm. Kevin Kiss. Yeah. Um, Kev- sound- yeah, that sounds I'm even sorry, better. it sounds like you sh- you'd have a dodgy career as an actor in a, a field that's something I've never photographed. <laughs> That'd be great, wouldn't it? Be, I wonder if Daniel goes around and Kevin every Kiss. time he introduces himself, oh, what's your name? My name's Daniel, Daniel Kiss. Kiss. And then people just think it's a demand. <laughs> <laughs> he says, uh, do you guys think the new fifth generation Fuji sensor or the next one could already um, use digital imaging tools such as enhancing bokeh, uh, digital zoom, etc., like the current smartphones? One main reason why people often choose full frame over APS-C is the narrower depth of field, yeah. which seems like it could be overcome with software. Any yeah. thoughts on this? Um, now, Andreas did actually chip in mm. on this thread in the, um, in, in the Fujicast Facebook group. Um, so I'll read out what he said, and I yeah. basically echo, echo his thoughts, I suppose. Uh, Andreas says, uh, as discussed on other threads, I believe the priority for camera companies when releasing new sensors is dynamic range, lower noise, lower light performance, uh, enhanced AF functionality, etc., etc. And yeah, I, I, I agree with that. You know, you you don't want a camera that's emulating a phone. You, you know, you, there's... What's the point? Well, you know, yeah, you, two things on that, Kev. I've never seen the phone do it really that well. Yeah, it looks okay when it's on a phone screen. You try and put that on a big print, and it, mm, no, I'm sorry, it's a bit washy around the edges. But the other thing is, are you saying that because uh, like photographers will be a little bit nervous of uh, of, of people being able to t- sort of have uh, auto bouquet and it, it being done so so well that again that gap lessens between being pro and being am yeah i i well perhaps but um yeah i think uh, you know andreas has nailed it really you, you, you know the camera manufacturers are putting their their power and the sensor manufacturers sony and the likes are, are putting their their efforts into making sensors that are you know more powerful better in lower noise all of that kind of stuff you know again it, it's a little bit like the previous question isn't it with the um the srgb and ar RGB, do, you know, we don't need to be, I don't think personally we need to be adding yeah. functionality to cameras that are very niche, very um, unlikely to be used much and, and just take up R&D and costs and, and all of that stuff. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. camera's a camera, phone's a phone, software is software. Uh, you know, somewhere in the middle, they shall all meet. Was that Andrea said last week and he'll say this week within the questioning as well? <laughs> Look, what do you want us to spend money on? Where, where's your priorities here? Um, yeah, and exactly it's, that. It's, yeah. te- so it's team you know, size and everything like that, isn't it? Yeah, so if they if they laid down three options on the table right now and said, you know, you can in five years' time, you can have a camera that's got a global sensor that's, uh, you know, it's, it's just fantastic in low light. It's mm. got, a, you know, a, a zero millisecond autofocus speed. Or you can have a camera that has a similar sensor to today but you can use your thumbs and fingers on the back to add a little bit of bokeh and do, you know, HDR and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. What are you going to yeah. choose? 
but yeah, I mean, I see the point. I see what what um, Daniel's saying though, in terms yeah. of there are thing there are things that seemingly seem very simple being done in phones. Yeah. Um, but you also have to remember, phones actually have a lot of computational power in them, software power. You know, they're built for software processing. They've got, uh, you know, in uh, often cases they've got eight, sixteen gigabytes of RAM in them, and various yeah. things like that. So those kind of things, it's yeah, it's just different, isn't it? Different. Mm. Here's um here's one from Simon Blakesley. Um I want to actually click on simonblakesley.ca. Let me just click on here because I've got a feeling there's going to be some superb uh, aircraft pictures coming up. Oh yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. Sorry, that's a bit rude. I'm going, "Oh yeah. Oh, look at that." <laughs> and you're at the other end of this at the moment thinking, "What? What's he looking at?" We'll put a link on the the show page this week. Uh good day gents. I'm a listener to the show, a new listener to the show. Yada yada. My name is Simon Blakesley, and I'm an aviation photographer in Whitehorse. Um, is it Yukon in Canada? It is, isn't it? My family is uh, originally from Leicester prior to moving to Canada. Dad was uh, a Royal Navy fleet air arm photographer based in Malta in the 40s and 50s. Boy, I bet he had some great stuff. Um, aviation photography therefore seemed a natural progression to me. More than just a hobby, I'm a photographer for a Canadian airline and have worked hard over the past 14 years to uh, elevate my aviation photography to where it's received recognition through winning national contests, being published on magazine covers and being selected for the cover of an upcoming, get this, Kev, Canada Post stamp issue. Whoa. I think when you get your picture on a stamp, that, that is the ultimate, isn't it? Yeah, You've absolutely. done it. You've arrived. No more yeah. to, there's no yeah, more to yeah. see. Look at the Queen. The Queen's been taking over that market for years. <laughs> Maybe someone else is there. Well done. <laughs> for my entire life, I've done all my shooting using a DSLR brand whose name rhymes closely with Yukon. Um, this year, in the aim of reducing weight and bulk, I've become an XT4 user with a new 70 to 3, a fairly new 70 to 300 Fuji lens. Here's the situation. When I focus on an aircraft as it accelerates down the runway, the autofocus loses acquisition and hunts. Many of the shots are thus totally blurry until the autofocus eventually regains acquisition. I don't know whether this is due to the shiny paint finish of commercial aircraft. Oh, that's an interesting thought. Whirring props, throwing the focus off, or something else that I've not thought of or identified. I shoot in continuous focus mode to account for the aircraft accelerating towards me. I use zone focus and Kev's favourite, back button focus. I'm at the point where I'm back to relying on the camera that rhymes with Yukon, as I don't feel I can fully trust my system for my uh, my work, though I wish I could. Any suggestions, please? So what do you think, Kev? I mean, everything that he's, he's talking about there, continuous focus, yes. Mm. Um, zone, back button, that's the quickest way of doing it. Yeah, I'd say probably could well be the, um, the the lack of contrast on the on the airplane. You, you do need it does need some kind of contrast. So if it's yeah. a sheer white or you know whatever, um, then it is it probably will find it quite difficult. Um, it shouldn't be a problem if it's the you know the nose tip or the window or something like that. Such but, a, why, why don't you focus on the engine? Although I know you said blurry props cause a problem. If it was yeah, a, blurry props. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the en- the engine cowling might work. Um, I mean, I'm sure he's probably tried all of these different things. Um, undercarriage, the maybe under, like. undercarriage. It just won't. It won't. It, you know, all, all cameras are going to have difficulty tracking. Yeah. Uh, you know, a solid color really because it, it just can't grip onto it. You know, nothing for it to grip onto effectively. So his Yukon that he's using, as we'll call it now. Then I assume that yeah, of course, the, it's focusing in a different way, isn't it? Of course, it is. DSLR yeah. to mirrorless totally different focusing yeah 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 so the yeah. the the future film systems will be using phase detection yeah. pixels which will need contrast for them yeah. to to grip onto mm, that's going to be a tricky one then yeah i mean well there must be contrast somewhere yeah are these things moving quickly towards him did he say or are they static well, dep- no no they're moving towards him accelerating down the runway towards him uh, the yeah. autofocus loses acquisition and hunts back and forth and of course not uh, uh, he's mentioning prop aircraft so what is it 100 and 120 knots 130 knots is it as the other thing to double check is that Maybe you've less. got um, your um, continuous priority, uh, focus priority set to release rather than focus. If ah. you have your continuous priority set to focus, ah. it will be trying to focus on every single image it's bursting on. Whereas if you have it set to release, you will lose maybe one or two, but you should get 
eighty to ninety percent of the of the others in because it's it's going to give itself time to you know to do its thing. Whereas focus, it's trying to make sure every single burst shot is in focus, which it won't be a, with something moving that quickly towards you. And it doesn't. I I think in default it doesn't come set like that, does it? No, I don't think so. I Although think when does. I looked at my XT4, it was set up that way. Was I it? have to say, oh. but previous cameras never used to be. So I don't know what the the standard is now. But yeah. check check that. Because that could yeah. be that could release be priority on your continuous focus, and we'll we'll put a link in his uh, his work is is uh, well as you would imagine outstanding, fantastic, must be a wonderful job that aviation photography really, hmm. and the travelling the travelling that you would do and yeah, I've spoken. What to- I'd want to stand in front of an aeroplane hurting itself towards me. Look, okay, if you don't stand in the middle of the runway, <laughs> where is he then? <laughs> well, I would imagine he's very close to the perimeter edge or or off off the um, off off the hold. Um, at one end, <laughs> he wouldn't be. So- Kev, you sit there, wait for it to come, and hopefully it will lift before it gets to you. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that'd be my. We've got Campbell Airfield near us. It's full of. It's the graveyard of jumbo jets. I know. It's filling it's up that of- one as well. I saw a feature about it recently. It's a fascinating place. Have you ever done a project there? Uh, not really. They they brought all of the last uh, seven. Well, seven yeah. uh, sorry, BA seven four sevens there did, recently. Yeah. So yeah. it's packed full of. Old seven four sevens, but BA seven four sevens. I did once. So it, it, it basically what it's a um, uh, kind of scrappage company that sits there. Yeah. So they sell off. Uh, they get the airplanes in. Then they sell off things like the engines and stuff like that oh, no, to amazing. Amazing. Uh, you know to other air, airliners and what have you. And everything goes. Even yeah. like the, the coffee pots all get sold off. <laughs> Um, and then the uh, the carcass eventually gets m- smelted down, I would imagine. Um, but everything goes. And I did once organise to do a project with the, the um, managing director. Right. And uh, uh, we, I'd arranged to go and see him, and we were going to go out and take some pictures and stuff like that. And yeah. I turned up, uh, and he was playing golf. Oh, oh, shame. Yeah, so it never happened. Oh. I did put a bid in for an aircraft seat once. They did. There was something going on there, and I, and I thought, well, I'd love an aircraft seat. That would be fantastic. But then I learned from another friend of mine who works for I can't say the company name because he's always said, don't ever mention the company name. But it's one of these companies that look after germs and pesties and stuff like that. And he told me what what actually Rent, was it Rent a Kill? N- no, he told me what <laughs> he told <laughs> he told me no he told me maybe he told me what what was actually in in the seats. The, the the germs and the things that are in aircraft seats. Oh, it's disgusting, oh, imagine, disgusting yeah. Kev. Yeah, yeah. Oof. Oh, I can absolutely imagine that. Yeah, gross. I'll tell you what, never mind COVID. The next time I travel, if I'm sitting in that seat, I'm just going to be putting that stuff on all the time, you know. The, the, I'm, I'm going to sit in a black bag. My, <laughs> my no. head poking out the end. <laughs> oh, dear, Kev. Uh, you wouldn't be able to reach your your paraphernalia of, anyway. of, of drugs and and <laughs> and alcohol that you seem to throw down your neck to get you through that uh, that experience. When I say drugs, uh, I mean prescription drugs. <laughs> anyway, should we move on? Ask yeah. an, uh, ask Andreas last week. Very successful. Thank you very much for all the questions that you sent in for Andreas to answer. He he will definitely will be coming back. But uh, this is part two of Ask Andreas. Now I know you answered this one um, within the uh, within the feed for obvious reasons, but uh, for those that didn't read the feed, and not everybody that listens to this show by by you know by a, a good amount uses Facebook. So Molly Kate uh, asked this question. Um, Molly said, "I'm curious if Fujifilm is aware and has comments on the lack of women in the ambassador program, both in the UK." and globally representing the brand as well as the individuals chosen to lead events in the UK. I, of course, now feel extremely embarrassed because when we were talking about a photographer a moment ago, I didn't remember her name instantly. But that was more about the fact that I, I, I sort of tried to take on everybody that was speaking within that piece. Yeah. Um, but but it, is, it is a comment that's made every now and then, isn't it? It, it is something, it is a comment that's made and it is a valid comment yeah. and it is something that we take very seriously um, in the UK and I'll only be able to comment about the UK because yeah. um, that's the only market that I'm responsible for. Um, with regards to our ambassador program, um, we, we've got five out of the um, 15 product ambassadors in the, in the UK are female. Yeah. Um, no, it's not 50-50, but it is much better than what it was when I started, albeit five years ago and what have you. So we're getting there, probably not as quickly enough, but it's very difficult to just sack everybody 
and then start afresh. It's one of those things that you have to evolve over time. So our goal is to get equal footing on the ex-photographers. So um, hopefully in the next year, we'll, we'll get closer mm. to that. Um, in terms of people that we feature, I think that the last few product videos that we've actually done have been use it using more um, female photographers. So XS10 was, was a female photographer, a lady by the name of Onyi Moss. GF80 mil, we... Um, I'm going to pronounce her name wrong, which is really annoying because everyone pronounces my name wrong as well. Um, I want to say Christina Varaksova, um, who featured on the GF80 mil. Mm -hmm. And then we had a video created by um, the team on the 10 to 24, which featured Emily and Dean. And then um, Dominic Shaw from York Place Studios course, yeah. Um, yeah. featured on the XE4 video. So of the last five videos that we've made, four were female photographers. Mm -hmm. One was a male photographer. Uh, the X Summit on Thursday featured more female photographers. So we heard from Sarah, we heard from Charlene. So I think the message is getting through even at the top level because they, they know that we need to champion more female photographers. We, we try and be as, as equal as we can um, in, the, in the UK, but I know that we need to do more. And with the ambassadors, how, how are they chosen in terms of, because you can't obviously have lots and lots of wedding photographers or lots and lots of portrait photographers. How, are they chosen at merit according to their you know how good they are, or, or does it have to be something to do with genre? I, I suppose it has to be a bit of both, doesn't it? it it's it's a bit of both. So there there are some there are some rules that we put in place to make our selection criteria a little bit easier. So the first uh, criteria that in the in the UK, and this is important to say, the, in the UK, the, so the first rule is they have to be a full time working professional photographer. Yeah. So the majority of their income has to come from photography. And the reason that that's put in place is to give some sort of credibility to the person that's representing the brand, that they are saying, I make most of my money from photography and I make most of my money from photography using Fujifilm kits. Yeah. The next step is that they have to have purchased the Fujifilm kit themselves. And the reason we do that, and we don't give people kit to say, oh, I'm going to say some nice things about Fujifilm now, is because part of my job to convince them to say nice things has already been done because they know why they're using the Fujifilm kit and they can say, no, 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 I'm using this because it's smaller. It's got the colors I like. It's got wh whatever else it, it might, it's got the ergonomics, whatever else it might be. Yeah. So those two are the first things that, that we do. And anyone that we start a relationship with on the path to becoming an ex-photographer, we ask them to write a blog, see if they can write. Yep. We ask them to potentially run a workshop for us, see if they can present themselves and their art to our customer base. Mm -hmm. We might ask them to do some sort of online webinar to see how good they are in terms of just, just talking for 45 minutes without, I don't want to say cheating, but without having to demonstrate product and things like that. Yep. Um, and then we may ask them to feature in a product launch or a product video primarily to see what they're like on film. Mm. And that is sort of like the requirement. So like everyone has had to go through that job interview, I suppose is the best way. Now, obviously these rules were put in place probably about four years ago. So there are other, there are ex-photographers that probably haven't had to go through that application process, but we are always looking at ways to refresh the scheme and encourage more people to collaborate with us. And obviously the US team, they, they were very bold last year. They shook things up massively and, yeah, and had yeah. um, changed their, their levels. So they've got creators, collaborators and ex-photographers, and they committed to changing every ex-photographer every couple of years. So yeah, so we're, we're, we're somewhere in between. We're not as extreme as the US, yeah. but we do have an application in inverted commas process that, that we follow. But yeah, you, you sort of like, who's a good evangelist for the brand? Who can take a decent photo? Who can do a decent talk? Who can run a workshop? And then it's like, right, do we have that genre or don't we? Yeah. I mean, if you look at our current lineup of ex-photographers, we've probably got four wedding photographers. Yeah all offer something a little bit different. Mm. So we've got Kevin, who has do, answered on a postcard what he offers. <laughs> um, we've got um, the team at York Place Studios, who obviously yeah. are, are a bit of a double act. So, yeah. so likewise, we do documentary, a lot of storytelling, um, but a bit quirky. We've got, we've got obviously, the, 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 the filming side of things as well, so they've got video as well. Then we've got Marianne, who, again, like York Place, but has a slight difference in that she uses flash. So so she she has something that's a little bit different. 
And then you've got Scott Johnson, Scott, who yeah. is very, uh, I, w- I want to say traditional wedding photography, not do- documentary wedding photography, but he produces these epic, I don't want to say stage, but more controlled shots yeah. as well as oh, yeah. a few of the other things. So everyone goes, well, why have you got four wedding photographers? Well, they all offer something a little bit different. Yeah. If I want to run a flash workshop, I'm not going. To, I can't call Kevin, and and that's sort of like one of the, one of the benefits of of having the the diversity uh, in the range of photographers that we use. I think you should mix it up one day and put Kevin in charge of the flash course. See what happens. Oh mate! <laughs> <laughs> so Kev, you're doing the flash course next month. Get yeah. ready. Read up. Yeah, you're doing the motorsport. Course. <laughs> Neil, Neil Parry. Um, here's one I've been thinking about that uh, I was going to ask you and uh, and Kevin, but maybe this is a better arena. What is best for the life of a battery and for the camera? Leaving it on, turning it on and off. On my photo walks, I often switch the camera off and then flick it on again a couple of minutes later when I see something I want to take a picture of. But what drains more? So mirrorless cameras specifically, if the camera is on and say like there's no um, power save function, if the camera's on, it will be draining. So what I've come to learn over the last six years of, of using um, X series is, is is switching it off after use. Because by the time you like put the camera in your hand and switch it on, and bring it to your eye it's on and good to shoot. yeah in terms of um, what's better for the battery in terms of longevity i think it's i think everyone's heard urban myths about every single type of battery you need to drain it fully you need to keep it constantly topped up so there's no sort of like i haven't been told by any engineers of any shortening of the lifespan of the battery by switching the camera on and off yeah. regularly yeah. and that would be my recommendation Elizabeth Gray, I just picked up a, a GFX 50S. I also shoot with an X-T3 and an X-100V. The thing I love most about Fujifilm is uh, the menu systems. Q menus, function buttons, they're all pretty similar. It makes moving between them easy. However, I'm wondering if there's a reason why exposure compensation can't be assigned to the front command dial on the GFX. Any chances of a change with that? So the thing about the GFX is that it's got the button as well. Yeah. Um, so you have to press the button and move the exposure compensation, which I believe was similar to the X-H1 because that has a, an exposure compensation button. You can't just, just change the front control dial. No. There, there, there's the button for that. So whereas on the other cameras, you can just flick it to C mode where you can control it on the control dial. I, I think it's unlikely that we'll see a complete override for the front control dial to become that because it needs someone to be pressing that button the one thing that i if i remember correctly and i apologize because i don't have a gfx 50s is that i thought you could change how that button worked whether it was a, a press on and off or press and hold right so, so not, i will have to um, look into that one look into that one ed hubbard fujifilm always seems to be walking a knife's edge by sometimes updating firmware performance on features on existing cameras even if eclipsed by newer models xt3 puts in brackets but also receiving criticism when it doesn't this is the damned if you do damned if you don't one isn't it or or does it slowly i understand that there are costs and complexity in doing this as well as an interest in nudging users towards new cameras that said it seems to me that a pay model or even kickstarter for firmware updates for older models might solve some of these issues what do you think i think it would be a complete and utter can of worms Mm -hmm. on the face value i i agree that if but if can you imagine Right, okay, these are the settings of your camera. Yeah. If you want faster autofocus, you need to pay £10, mm. as, as a for instance. If you want faster focus and you want some film simulations, you need to pay £20. Yeah. And then you, you end up splitting the, the, the range even more in terms of what each camera can offer. Yeah. So I, I get the question completely. And on first look, you think to yourself, that's easy. You just like, if you get someone to pay 50 quid to upgrade their cameras or a hundred pounds, it just ends up, I think, being a logistical nightmare. Could be a bit messy. Uh, Indy Lehman, how is the global computer chip shortage affecting camera production? Now, I know we touched on this, but we didn't really go into it. When, when is when is it expected that the manufacturing of computer chips will, will be able to meet the, the present demand? Oh, God, if we knew the answer to this, we'd be able to say, make, yeah, make I, a I fortune. I would be doing this, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Intel, there was a recent BBC article which said that Intel didn't expect chips production and shortages to be, us to be out of that, that problem until 2022. Yeah. Now, there are other politically 
issues with with intel trying to remove trying to move production from china and things like that but yeah our first estimation was that we expected supply to massively improve by october time um we've obviously launched gfx 50s which will be out at the end of september and there are no reasons for us to believe that that it shouldn't be exactly when everything will be back in stock impossible to to say joaquin bylane said i might be a minority here using an ipad pro instead of a a uh, real computer, but would love to see the X-Raw Studio available on iPad. Not a question, really, but a, but, a, but a wish. I think there are issues with how the camera talks to the iPad and the fact that it uses a different OS. Yeah. So even though, say, like the latest generation iPad Pro with, with its M1 chip and the fact that they've got MacBook Air with an M1 chip and processing-wise, they're exactly the same. Yeah. It's because of the operating system that it uses, it makes it difficult to read. So... Power is not an issue. It's just that you'd have to develop a whole new app and a way for Actual Studio to work. And we all know currently that if we diverted resources to that, everyone would shout saying, no, give me a camera remote app that works. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is the thing. It's like if you had a camera remote app that worked and the Actual Studio, and it's like, well, actually, should you have Capture One Mobile or Lightroom Mobile? You know what, you know what, you know what most people would be choosing. Yeah. Derek Miller, I'd love to be able to use nostalgic negative on my 50R. I'm guessing the hardware isn't up to it, though, based on the on the uh, the 50S2 getting it due to updated processor. Is this true? Um, as as far as I know, yes, mm. there are, there are processor limitations to to firmware up to, to the um, film simulation. So yeah, so he's going to have to update his camera. Yes, yeah. yeah. Jeff Petrie, what is the deciding factor, Andreas, to add new functionality via firmware updates to a particular camera? How are firmware updates tested prior to releasing them so they don't cause a fiasco, like which happened with the X-T4? Can we expect any more firmware updates for the X-T4? Why hasn't Nostalgic Negative been made available for the new cameras? So how are firmware updates um, decided? I mean, we, we sit in a room and we throw darts at a board (laughs) and where the darts land is what we get in terms of updates is that dartboard of mullins face by the way yeah yeah obviously it's actually a full cardboard cutout of mullins so (laughs) we just tend to aim for the groin (laughs) i knew you were gonna say that um right so the 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 question about firmware updates is obviously there's a there's a fine line between what what the engineers can do and what what's physically possible and and what what sort of like is financially possible I suppose because by the time you allocate the hours resources and the resources to it and things like that um, in terms of how things are tested we we rely on the team in Japan to uh, say that the actual firmware that they're giving us has been fully tested it's not something that is rolled out globally there's not there's not hundreds of beta testers um, we might get a pre-release a few days early so if the product specialists notice something we feed it back immediately and um, on a couple of occasions they've spotted it before launch and then delayed it um, I, I think there was an xs10 recent firmware update that was meant to happen that they spotted that there was a mistake in it and they delayed it. And, um, and other times, unfortunately, we so like we don't, but we, we do our best to to fix it as quickly as possible. And the XT4, what did he say? Debacle. It wasn't a fiasco. He called it fiasco. Fiasco. That was it. That Sorry. Was it. Yeah, we, we spotted it within a day and then we fixed it a week later. And what about his uh, nostalgic negative that he'd like? So originally, we when the nostalgic negative was announced with the GFX 100S, the engineers said at the time that they could only get nostalgic negative because of the larger sensor mm. on GFX and the fact that it can get more information, more tonality, and things like that. So um, that's what we were told at the time. Um, but they were going to investigate whether or not it was going to be possible. But the panel discussion that they had said that nostalgic negative wasn't going to come to x series anytime soon um we usually get this question or we've fielded it so many times about uh, why why there's not a monochrome when it comes to an x pro or something so uh, Derek miller's put a slightly different spin on it and has suggested why don't we have a true monochrome gfx i'd love one <laughs> but the i mean it comes down to the uh, how many people would buy one doesn't it yeah I, and this is the thing that you you make 
w- whenever you're you're developing a product, yeah. um, there, there is a bean counter somewhere that goes, right, okay, it's going to cost you X amount to develop that product physically, the production line, the logistics, the this, that, the other. Yeah. And how many of those are you going to make and then the profit and over the, the lifespan and things like that. And right now we're not confident that we'd sell enough to justify the development because it's not as simple as removing the color filter array from the front of the sensor because you have to rewrite the firmware completely to understand monochromatic rather than color um, algorithm so i I ask the question every single time um, i speak to the engineers and uh yeah do they say we shall consider they they've stopped even saying that (laughs) not even near that Isaac yeah. Pringle, perhaps slightly out of the wheelhouse of this group, but I want to ask anyway, what is the status of the current Fujifilm film production? Uh, do you know anything about that side of it? So I don't know specifically about the film production. I yeah. mean, the 400H, we announced at the start of the year that due to uh, the raw material availability, we were going to have to discontinue it at the end of the year. And based on the production, based on the amount that we were selling, we, we thought that it would take about 18 months to get through all the stock and then in the end everyone panic bought and bought it up in six months velvia 100 um, because of new us regulation isn't allowed to be sold there because one of the layers i think uh, one of the adhesives in between one of the layers is doesn't conform to new standards and, mm. and things like that. I didn't know that so film sales are still steady do i know if we are going to see second generation versions of anything come back like across two came back i I don't know i'm sorry i'm not i'm not close enough to that side of the business yeah uh, Mark Hole on the X100V when the screen is flipped out it disables the eye sensor which is brilliant but i no longer own the v i've upgraded to the X Pro 3 is there any chance the X Pro 3 could get a firmware update that gives it the same ability as the X100V or is this something that just can't be done through the programming I would never say never when it comes to can a firmware update mm. happen because ultimately all all that happens with the V is that when the screen moves, the eye sensor is disabled. So is it possible? I mean, yeah, it is possible. Is it likely? I, I, I don't know. But it will be one of those things that we can feed back to the engineers in Japan during our quarterly product session and say to them, guys, have we thought about adding this? Ignacy Zulawiski. Possibly a perennial question, Andreas, but I haven't found a satisfactory answer yet. Why does AEL only work in auto modes, e.g. aperture or shutter priority, and not when both aperture and shutter are manually set? If other manufacturers offer this, surely you can as well. Yeah, but if we did things that (laughs) other manufacturers did... um, I I believe Carl attempted to to answer the question, um, who's, who's far more technical... Um, and better suited to, to these types of questions. Yeah. But again, it's one of those things that I've noted the feedback and, and I'll uh, send it back to the team in Japan and say, listen, guys, can we look at doing things um, like this? The, the challenge that you have with, with requesting firmware updates is like, is is it a bug fix? Is it a new feature completely? Is it just an update to an existing feature? And I always liken it to going food shopping when you're hungry. And what happens is you walk in saying, I just want a packet of crisps. And what you end up getting is five packets of crisps, a loaf of bread, three chocolates, some fizzy drink. And you're like, well, I didn't even want all of that sort of thing. And and the challenge when having loads and loads of things that we're asking for firmware-wise, and what you actually want are like the top three things that you ask for. Hmm. But then the engineers give you the things that are like from 10 to 20. They're like, yeah, but I didn't really want those. I just hmm. put them there to pad out the list sort of thing. So I'll ask the question. Yeah. I can't make any promises when it comes to firmware updates. We do our best to listen, but we're a relatively small team when it comes to um, firmware and, and engineering. So... Right now, if someone said to me, do you want firmware updates for the X-T4 that gives you X, Y, Z, A, B, C, or do you want to delay the next generation of cameras by six months? Yeah. Miles Gom, I think we've got time for two more questions. Now we have the replacement for the original 18mm and 56mm. When is the 3514 coming out? Dare I ask the elephant in the room question? Do you want to guess what that one is? 56 mil? No, the X-H2. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So he's got three. He's got sort of 
a few questions there. Lens and camera body. And we, we kind of okay. touched on camera body in the first part last week, didn't we? Yeah, so we've updated the 8 we've got a new 18 mil we didn't update that's the important thing we didn't update the 18 mil f2 we we got a new 18 mil 1.4 brand new we we have a brand new 33 mil f1.4 yeah and we're keeping in the range of the 35 mil 1.4 for those that one don't want to spend 700 quid yeah and still want a 1.4 lens one who don't see the advantage of having weather resistance who don't mind the, the slightly start focusing etc cetera, etc cetera. and for those that want that look in inverted commas that they get from that 35 mil. So we've got a 33 mil 1.4. We have a new 23 mil 1.4, which will coming out in November, which will replace the existing 23 mil 1.4. And you can make any assumptions that, that you like, but if you look at the recent additions to the Fujifilm range, we updated the 1024 about a year ago. We updated the 27 mil. Yeah. We've updated the 23 mil. So the team are in parallel working on brand new glass and updating, well, updating some of the older ones. lenses yeah yeah so 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 it is just just one of those things and and those updates will be happening for a number of reasons it's like the the new generation of, of lenses are, are designed for are future proofing themselves against high resolutions and, yeah. and things like that so if any of the older lenses are seen to not be able to resolve and, and not future proof them then they might be updated so it are, do we need weather resistant versions do we need linear vo- motor versions do we need um better um video versions with less breathing and things like that well that so, was touched on wasn't it in the in the summit video where it was suggested the the new 18 to, to 120 was mentioned and the concept of yeah. it being a new interface for for both stills and video which left me thinking yeah. what well, does that mean it needs to be a t-stop as well as an f-stop or is that even possible yeah i, I don't know so all of these things these these engineers have to have to worry about. And you've got one team who, if you think about it, you, you look at what, what gets asked for and you've got people saying, I need a fast, wide prime, like a 10 mil F2. Yeah. And then the next post is someone saying, I need a 400 mil 2 because you don't look at, you aren't taking seriously our wildlife photographers. And then you've got the same team having to update yeah. the existing lenses as well. Yeah. And then you've got, because they're the lens team, you've got them having to um, make the GFX lenses as well. So they have to grow that range. And it's, and it's yes, we've got two systems, but we haven't got two different teams sort of thing. So to quote a famous film setting, we're going to need a bigger team. <laughs> we're going to need a bigger team. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, XH, yeah. Uh, well, two letters, one number. XH2 was the other thing he said. Yeah. <laughs> Our management have committed to yeah. developing an XH2. Yeah. Um, will an XH2 happen? Yes. Yeah, some stage. Um, some stage, but it's like all in good time. Mike Watton, um, any plans to be able to, uh, to just share uh, settings across cameras by copying onto SD cards? Like, like, Nikon, Nikon, Nikon. Yeah, yeah, we've we've asked for that, yeah. and I think Kevin asked for that as recently as I think he did. Yeah, no, the last time I know Kevin asked for that was 2018 when we were in Japan together, right. um, and it was something that we were told that the current sensor processor can't do. Can't do, but future, who knows? Who knows? John Jack, there is um, there is just one more actually. I, I know I said last two, but John Jackson, um, this one's for you really. How does he stay so humble when they have the best cameras and lenses out there right now? <laughs> uh, That's I, a I nice way the, to uh, I, I read the posts from the trolls, to be honest. Uh, you must be excited. And roll my eyes. And, yeah. <laughs> you must be excited, though, with uh, the 10th anniversary coming up next year. Of, um, there must be, there's got to be something planned that will celebrate it. Ne- next year will be be a big part amazing yeah and our thanks to Andreas Georgiadis the group marketing manager for Fujifilm and that was the concluding part of Ask Andreas we'll do another one in the near future I'm sure now if you want um, extra Mullins this week well if you go to the show page you will find a link to his country music show which is on incapablestaircase.com he takes to the air live each week 3.30pm UK time Though you can, of course, play catch up as well on incapablestaircase.com. And uh, if you'd like more podcasts to download, as well as uh, our own back catalogue of all those previous shows, including the lockdown specials of last year, there's my show, Photography Daily, uh, available wherever you get your podcasts. On the website, there's the uh, Daily 365 feature on photographydaily.show. And as a podcast, 
Every Friday, we take a photo walk with listener letters, thoughts, and your pictures. We make pictures together as we walk and talk, and we have a weekly guest who this week is the artist and photographer Simon Buckley, working in the middle of the night or early, early, early morning as he makes photographs to tell the story of Manchester and Salford and Dartmoor and Macclesfield Forest in a fascinating project called Not Quite Light, magically bringing the places he visits to life. Something that can take nerves of steel too, particularly if you're a creative person with a big imagination. And I remember sitting in my car and I could hear this owl hooting and uh, and the wind was kind of starting to, to whip up and you know it has a very ghostly it does, uh, sound yeah. when it comes through the yeah. branches. Yeah. And again I remember thinking what am I doing here? You know, And it really caused me to feel confronted but actually it's absurd when you think about it because all that was at work there were the fairy tales of childhood of Hansel and Gretel but I, I live in Salford and arguably a million times more dangerous than uh, Macclesfield Forest which has got virtually no threat at all. There are no bears or lions or wild cats. All I had to do was overcome my imagination. But the first two or three trips were very difficult. Photographer Simon Buckley is my guest on Friday on the photo walk. Not quite light. It's a really interesting story. And uh, he's really inspiring too, with four decades of professional experience and creativity. Photography Daily is on all your podcast player apps. Right, back to your questions. Uh, it's your turn, I think. Fa- Facebook question first. Okay, Steve Vaughan, our moderator of the Facebook yeah, group. Yeah, very important, man. Kev, Neil, I'm seeing lots of photographers posting in other groups asking for second shooters for weddings, often at short notice. Yeah. As you know, Sam Vaughan and I have always worked together. I can't imagine photographing a wedding with someone whom I've never worked with or perhaps not even met before. Yeah. I also don't know how I would position this to the couple who have booked it. Do they just say, I'll find a second shooter on the day? I know both don't often use seconds, i.e. us. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think, you know, if somebody's professional and they're, they're, there's some great second shooter groups out there that you can go to. It's a bit, take it back to the aviation thing. Plenty of captains fly with first officers they've never met in their life. And, they, and 300 people sitting behind them trust both of them. Yeah, that's that's the point, isn't it? I I had um, uh, James Souls shot with me uh, a couple of weekends ago. Yeah, how did that go? That was great. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'd met him before, of course, yeah. and you know, I, I kind of know his work is good. But we'd never shot before together, no. and uh, and yeah, it was fine. It was really nice to have somebody there for the day. Actually, we had a bit of a laugh. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, I would be more than happy as long as you know, I wouldn't just kind of a name I'd never heard of, and if they didn't have a website and You'd all that. You'd take kind of advice, stuff. wouldn't you? You'd say, "Is anybody ever work with X?" And they'd say, yeah, she's, she or he is great. Well, that's good enough for me. Thanks very much. Yeah, and of course, the problem we have right now is the reason why there's such a, a rush for second shooters and stuff is, although it's very rare for me, you know, that's the only one I needed, but for a lot of people that usually have second shooters, yeah. their their second shooters are also dealing with their own businesses that have got um, rebooks and reschedules and things like that, so they can no longer do second shooting gigs. Yeah. So that's why there's this this big, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a professional second shooter, of which there are some yeah. now is the time to understand supply and demand and, yeah. and uh, the economics of that and the equilibrium point i would be sticking my prices right up i'm saying this after i've just paid james this morning <laughs> <laughs> cheeky um yeah the second shooter but there's a few facebook groups for second shooters i am in one of them actually because i i have done a bit of second shooting now and then because i think it's good sometimes to to do that i i quite like that. i haven't done it for a while i've second shot for you kev yeah. Um, yeah, yeah 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 no i quite like it also i don't think i don't know if i've ever second shot for you no don't think um, I, I wouldn't ask the great marlins to second shoot for me heaven's sake. Uh, no i would enjoy it I, I quite like the idea of a non-stress no editing <laughs> yeah that's yeah, true yeah you know i yeah. think you know i think that's cool i mean I, I, the hard thing is giving up your saturday i mean i would do it to help somebody out yeah. but i wouldn't do it if it wasn't somebody I, I knew well and knew that they needed help kind of thing but yeah I mean, there are people who make that's their living. They are professional second yeah. shooters. And, you know, they just turn up, they do the shooting, and then they, they dump the cards. But like a supply teacher, Kev. Yeah, just like a supply teacher. Well, what yeah. about... Uh, now, here's a good question, though, to go with that. And this this is relevant. If... Um so I know Steve sh- Steve shoots Sony, and so does Sam. Should you look for a second shooter that shoots on the same system as you? Because, of course, there'll be uh, some peculiarities about systems when it comes to uh, 
when it comes to the edit that that are similar yes for me it's important that if i'm if i'm editing other people's images that they're using the same system yeah. i wouldn't be comfortable editing you know canon nikon sony all of that kind of stuff so yeah for me it's important yeah. doesn't mean it is for everybody else though of course no good question though david swells to dci barnaby and sergeant troy <laughs> aka neil and kev oh we talked about this a couple of weeks ago didn't we it's some murders yes if you both by far the best TV show ever produced after Only Fools and Horses. Well, you don't like anything that's too frightening, though, do you? No, Miss and Murders is just about right. Have you ever watched anything like Stranger Things? No. Would you? Just the name of it. Why? Why would you? Oh, it's really good. No, it seems terrible. There's, there's... Why would you watch that when, when Escape to the Chateau is on? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> well, I was watching uh, Silent Witness the other night, and she had a she had a dream. Anybody that's seen Silent Witness, sorry if you're in another country and you haven't seen this, but Silent Witness, there was a, there was a particular dream sequence. I knew it was going to happen. I knew this face was going to go boom like that. I knew it. I could see it, Kev, coming. But I dropped my wine almost. That's yeah. why I don't watch those things. But I love it. It's a bit like a scary ride, Kev. You don't what? really love it but you feel you need to do it. No, I don't. Okay. And if there's a risk of dropping alcohol. (laughs) Even less, yeah. Um, If you both stop working freelance, says David, and started a photo business together, non-podcast related, what would you call it? Well, we've already discussed that, haven't we? We've got a coffee shop, black and white. Oh, no, Um, no, no. Started a photo business together, non-podcast. Oh, it's got to be a photo business. Sorry, I thought you meant business. A photo business together? Kev, I'd go in with you and do pots, pots of paint. They sounded like... They didn't cause any trouble at all. Yeah, we could be called Peter Pan, the Pots and Paints paint p- p- photographers. <laughs> Peter Pan, the Pots and Paints p- photographers. That's a big business card. Yeah, it <laughs> is. I don't know. I mean... What would we call our photo business? I, don't, I, I can't actually think of any other... I mean, there's obviously lots of different genres of photography, but, yeah. you know, how many other businesses are more than... You know, apart from studios, perhaps, where they have, you know, assistants and other shooters and everything, most yeah. of them are kind of independent stuff, aren't yeah, they? yeah. You know, it's not like you could, you could, I've always, you know, I would love to be like a uh, photojournalistic agent. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. So an agency, um, that'd be pretty cool. I'd like to do photojournalistic editorial stories in a corporate environment. I've always fancied that. So turn up at the mini factory in Oxford, for example, and and tell the story of the line for, I don't know, for, for two or three weeks. Love that. An airport, talking about air, um, aviation photography. I've always wanted to work in an airport, telling the stories of people uh, working or, or arriving or leaving. That's more about what you would like to do rather than what we could do together as a team. But that's exactly what I would say you and I could work together in. I know what. I could be the fellow what answers the phone. Ring, what? ring, ring, ring. Hello, yeah. hello. I would like a uh, a story at the mini factory photographed, please. And Hold you just on, send Paula. me over. <laughs> Neil, are you free? Neil, what are you doing now? Get off the Xbox, got you a job. What are you doing, though, during this time? You're just going to sit in your office in Malmesbury and I'm going to go and earn the money. I'm filling the invoices in. Oh. Well, I think this <laughs> doesn't feel quite correct to me. I'm filling the invoices in and listening to Johnny Cash. Are you? And yeah. I'm going to do the, the, the photography and the editing and the travelling and the schmoozing. Yeah, that's right, because that's, you just said that's the bit you love, and I love Johnny Cash and money. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what are we calling it then? Well, just call it Johnny Cash Photography. Yeah, why not? Yeah. yeah. We, we'll just call it the, uh, the Photographer in Black. The Photographer in Black. Oh. There we go. There's yeah. the answer. Okay. Uh, thank you, David Swales, who actually does sound like – that That should be a DCI name, shouldn't it? DCI David Swales. Yeah. It does sound definitely. like one, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one, that. Definitely. definitely. Right. Should we do the book? Yes. Um, okay. So the book uh, the book is called Wear a Mask, mm. Oxford Pandemic Portraits by Martin Stott. It's only a little book, little kind of um, not quite A4, bit bigger than bit bigger and fatter than A5, softback book. Um, I'll read. Uh, I'll read a bit of the blurb off the front. Mm-hmm. Um, Between early 2020 and spring 2021, Oxford, like the rest of the UK, was subject to a series of restrictions to combat the spread of COVID-19. After initial hesitation, the government stipulated that face masks should be worn in certain contexts to reduce transmission. Uh, these masks soon became obligatory, but also a matter of personal choice in terms of how they looked and what they signified. And then it goes on to say, over a year, uh, Oxford-based photographer Martin Stott recorded hundreds of images of masked individuals in the city, etc., etc., etc. So the reason why I kind of like this book is um, because it is literally very simple portraits. They're not 
particularly they're not you know it's not set up with flash or anything like that it's yeah. daylight you know there's there's no real kind of uh, i suppose artistic merit in them in that respect but they're interesting because it's showing me all of these different face masks that people were wearing and my word there are some incredible face masks i don't think i've seen any of this kind of system i mean there's there's the, the book standard ones the ones that really interest me are the ones earlier on in the book so um you know when people were kind of making their own ones out of underpants and various things like that underpants, because you know you can get hold of them at that point and then you've got you've got these uh, you've got people wearing full-on full-on like hazmat suit masks you know and uh, quite a few of these i think are more likely to be dust what do they call it dust um dust masks that you'd use if you're doing any kind of um, oh, yeah. sawing and yeah, all that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff yeah and yeah, I mean, it's it's actually in a weird way, it's very beautiful because you can't see much of the faces. Of course, you, you know, you can try and figure out whether they're smiling or whether they're just staring. But I just love the choices. You know, I love the fact that some people are color coordinating their masks with their clothes. There's a guy on page 58. He's got this um, kaleidoscopic shirt on, mm. um, and then he's got this 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 very similar face mask that's that's kind of uh, you know very exactly the same pattern, straight opposite page 59 is a guy in a, a bluey grey woolen jumper my fashion um, accessories here Kev that you're yeah describing. and then he's got a, a bluey grey woolen <laughs> kind of face mask not woolen but a face mask that would be a bit and, yeah, it's a fa- it's a, yeah it's a it's you know it's an accessory and then um, you know it's a really interesting and I know that we've talked in the past about will the world be sick of these pandemic books and all that kind of stuff and uh, you know given time it will all become nostalgia and it will be important of yeah, course yeah. but this is slightly different in that it is just portraits of people in their masks and I, I find that intriguing really because you know certainly in this country I know in, in some parts of Asia and stuff masks have been the norm for a long time but in this country they haven't and, and hopefully you know God willing they'll go away altogether all again soon Do you think they will? Uh, do, do you think that some people will now forever wear a mask in, in certain situations? Some people I won't I, I can't wait to not wear any I mean, I still wear them when I go into shops and stuff, although we don't have to now. No. But, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think, I mean, in Japan, for example, the way the mentality works over there is if you've got a cold, if you get a cold or you, you're feeling a bit under the weather, you put a mask on to protect others. Yeah. And that, that makes sense. Yeah, does, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And maybe that's the way we will go forward. But I certainly, you know, I certainly want to get get away from this situation where, you know, if you're walking up the street and somebody's walking towards you and then they, they kind of look at you as if you've got a, a, a gun in your hand and they jump into the middle of the road to walk around you. You know, that's not life. I'm not feeling that now. I think people have stopped doing that. Uh, that you're happening. right. For a while, uh, you know, people would they'd, they'd sort of rectangle around you, which was truly very odd. Yeah, well, that's what they were telling us to do. This so it was the right thing to do, you know, two yeah. meters. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly understand also that people are still wary of it. You know, and more people are getting it now than ever before. But, mm. you know, it's I want it to to go away, and I really hope. I mean, it won't go away. The virus won't go away. But I, I really hope that we can. Uh, I guess that within a reasonably short period of time, it will be a case of oh. I've tested positive for COVID, pop down boots and get some tablets or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's hopefully the way it will go. And, and yeah, masks uh, hopefully will become a thing of the past. There was generally. a whole socio thing over, over mask wearing, wasn't there? And um, statements that people wore. And this book obviously looks like it, it shows that. I'm a little bit concerned, by the way, that you said to make them out of underwear, that people used to make them out of underwear. Because cause initially, my mother-in-law made all the masks for our family. I'm not, not quite comfortable with the fact that I may have been wearing a pair of knickers. <laughs> it doesn't seem quite appropriate to me, Kev. Yeah, no, oh. uh, i got a story about that, but I'm not going to tell it, no. Uh, I did wonder why they were leopard skin, I have to say. <laughs> I the, the wedding, uh, do you remember the wedding? The one on t- the cover is leopard skin, funny enough. Oh, is it? <laughs> It's not my mother-in-law's, I'm sure. <laughs> the, the, do you remember that wedding that said to me, uh, don't wear a mask because I don't want it to be a freak show? Do you remember that yeah, one? Yeah. The mask I decided to wear for that one, I, I purposefully chose, said, be happy on the front. Um, I, I, I searched long and hard for that one. I thought, where, what mask can I wear? And I, for a moment I thought, no, you know, shall I wear one of those skull ones? Because You I, can get masks that look like, you can send a picture of yourself to the, the company and no. they'll make a mask that looks like your face. That's weird. Yeah, really weird. Because then you'd be speaking and your mouth wouldn't be moving. That is strange. Yeah. Could I? I might order one that's Mullins face. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, we should have got on this one, Kev. We completely missed the boat on this one. That's normal. Yeah. Could have had a whole load of merch on that. <laughs> be a Mullins. Yeah. <laughs> 
that ah. would be funny. But uh, no, it sounds a very interesting book, though. It is an interesting book, yeah. yeah. And I'm not sure. I've just looked it up on Amazon. It's not there. So I think it might be a um, you know an early edition. So we will. I'll link to the publisher as soon as you know on the on the face on the um, website. Where did you see it, Kev? Because it, it's I'm always intrigued by by how you choose your books. Well, truth be told, this turned up in the post. Ah, okay. Well, that's how you chose it then. It chose yeah. you. It chose you. It chose me, yeah. But yeah. I don't think it's come from the um, author of the book. I think it's come from the publishers. But there you oh, go. Good. So, right. Yeah. Link, links as always on the uh, the show page today. Um, now we're going to check. We need we need to sort of um, change gear Im- immeasurably on this because this is quite a serious question um, from Richard Simcoe. Um, hello, gents. I hope you're both doing fabulous. Here's a serious question about a particular photo, but can be applied to many. Richard Simcoe. I've seen. Have we seen his website before? I'm just clicking onto it. RichardSimcoe.com. Oh yeah. Oh, it's. A, I'm doing it again. Amazing work. Um, photos taken uh, uh, during an Antarctica expedition on board mm-hmm. a Dutch tall ship. Mm. Oh, look at these pictures. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So he's a very, very good photojournalist. Um, mm-hmm. That's good because I now understand why he's asking this question. Really. I'd like to ask what you think about the World Press Photo 1986 winning picture of Amira Sanchez. Do you know Amira Sanchez? Have you? I mean, we'll fill, fill you in with the story, Kev, but I know this story because I, I did an episode on Photography Daily. It was episode 63 about, about Amira. Um, the story in short is that a girl was trapped under the debris for three days as, as a result of a volcanic eruption and mm. a, a land stroke mudslide. In the end, she succumbed to hypothermia and gangrene, and the photograph was taken shortly before her death. Mm-hmm. It's a very famous picture. Yeah. Um, according to a few sources, it was impossible to save her given the circumstances. And actually, that's not according to a few sources. That's the truth. They just yeah. could not release her. If you were a photojournalist there that day, would you have taken the picture? This photograph is haunting me since I learned about it and the story behind it. I am torn. So, yeah, I did an episode on it because I was, I was quite torn by the picture as well. And, and quite, I, I was sort of a mixture of emotionally disturbed, fascinated, but, but not in a negative sense, um, in, a, in a human sense. I mean, it's a human tragedy story. And, and I was fascinated by the photographer who is um, Frank Fournier was the photographer about how and why he took it but would you have taken the same picture would you have felt like you could frank frank and one one bit of details missing here that he actually spent time with uh with amira this this little girl uh, as she passed and he didn't leave her side um Mm. so there was a humanitarian side to that complete story yeah so yeah, there is a lot more to this story, isn't there? So yeah. Frank Fournier was the was the guy that got that that one picture, won, but there is yeah. a whole load of pictures mm. around the couple of days beforehand. There's the rescuers trying to get her out. Um, you know, there's 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 a it's a it's a well documented yeah. moment. Yeah. Um, so his picture was one of many. Uh, it just happened to be the one that was, you know, the iconic one, I suppose. Um, but the ones, the ones that I find more harrowing are the ones from the days before, the, de- the you know, earlier in those, in the in in the the tragedy, where people are in the pool with her, trying to pull her out, and you know, just trying to do their best. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's heartbreaking. Would I have taken the picture? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's you know. If if I uh, know I've never been uh, an important photographer, so and I mean by that I mean in that kind of circumstance. Yeah. But yes, I mean you you know you can't just you know you can't essentially say I don't want to take pictures of bad things because you know how will we ever know and learn? We need to we need these things to be documented for sure. Yeah. There's documented cases of of people where you know the photographers are put getting the photo ahead of helping the person mm. and that's a different thing um you know the the photographer frank fernio in this case is not there there are people helping her there there are yeah. people there's proper rescues there trying to do their job so it's not like he's taking his picture while she's kind of asking him for help so that's that's a very different thing. He did roll uh, he did roll up his sleeves and get involved in it as well. It must be said. Yeah, I'm sure he probably. I think anybody who was there would have done yeah. it. absolutely. And you they know, tried. They tried frantic. everything. And they tried everything. And they could not release her. It, you no. know, she would no. she would have died um, if they'd have tried 
in those waters to have um, have uh, performed an amputation. It couldn't happen, Kev. Um, they didn't have the equipment, the skill. You've got to remember that that this is this this disaster has happened as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's also, I mean, there's that. Um, there's the awful story as well of I bet Kevin Carter. You know, the um, photographer who was photographing it during apartheid. Um, and, and his his story is in a brilliant book called The Bang Bang Club. Um, but but outside of the apartheid stuff, there was the um, the picture of the the vulture and the little girl. Oh yes, where yeah. he, yeah. Um, you know, he was. Uh, I think it was in Sudan. He was in Sudan at this point. So there's this little girl, very emancipated, you know, on death's door kind of thing. Um, and there's a vulture stood in the background, waiting, just yeah. waiting for this little girl to to die. Um, and my understanding is the fact of the matter is that she was outside a um, a rescue center. So, you know, she was she was clearly really, really unwell. Mm. But he got he got so much abuse in the end. He, he committed suicide, mm. um, sure. you know, which is absolutely awful. Mm. So, you know, there's circumstances that are beyond our comprehension unless you've been been in those places. Yeah. You know, we you and I are not not. You know, we, we we don't have the validation to no. to make comments on on people's positions I, I, like that. I wonder, um, as a person, what I would do in those sort of situations, though, and whether I've asked Giles this many times. You know, my my good buddy Giles, who um, in the Balkans War came across horrific situations where he was uh, where he went to um, homes and institutes where. Where children were uh, chained to uh, to beds, and the, I used to, I said, Giles, would you must have wanted to take every single one of those children home? He said, Of course you do, of course you do. I'm there to do a job, and it's not always very pleasant, but you know. And the same with Tom Stoddart, with a little 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 boy in the bag of grain, another very famous picture. I think that's Sudan as well, where um, where just an adult, you know, he's dragging this grain home to his family, and. This adult passes by and, and thinks, "Well, there we go. That, that's easy pickings," and takes the grain from the child. And I said to Tom at that stage, "I said, did you want? Did you chase after him? What What would you do?" Yeah, I mean, we just don't. You know, we're we're not qualified to even understand it, let alone. I don't you know. think the, those that are taking the pictures sometimes at the time are qualified because Perhaps, they, they yeah. are they're just, they're people. They are people. Mm. They're people first. Yeah. Um, Good question, though, but a very difficult one. But you've said, yeah, you would have taken the picture. It was, and it remains a very, very important picture. And I'm just reading more on the um, that the picture of the vulture and the little girl because I wasn't sure. It's called the vulture and the little girl, but yeah. I think it's actually a boy and did survive. Yeah, so did did get to the feeding station. Yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah. Wow. Thank you, Richard, for your question. Um, have we got time for one more, Kev? Yeah, go on, just grab one out the Facebook and that'll be the last Okay, last so question. this is from a few weeks ago, Matthew Jennings. He yeah. says, uh, following on from the discussions in, uh, this would have been a few weeks back, uh, about online trolls, um, do you believe measures should be put in place so that all social media accounts can only be opened by a user inputting a personal identifier, i.e. passport, driving license, to open an account? Would this help reduce negativity or at least change the way negativity feedback is fed back? I 100% agree with that i would love that to happen i was discussing that with disco dave just a couple of weeks ago and yes uh, why not why not if you want to open a twitter account you've got to put in your you know mm. they, they say right you've got to be 18 you've got to put in some kind of id some say and uh, these are probably the people that have most to lose because they are most hiding behind um, anonymity that uh, that it, it opens a, a possible can of worms um, when it comes to f freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Well, you know, I don't yeah. care about cans of worms if it stops online racism and people mm. killing themselves. Yeah, true. The worms can come out of the can as fast as they frigging well want. Did you read about the Chinese um, system now? I don't know if this is across the nation or in one particular area where children are being uh, only allowed to use yeah. um, <laughs> gaming for three hours a week. Yeah, no, one hour a day, wasn't it? I th oh, but, uh, yeah, you're right. It is three hours a week. It's one hour yeah. a day, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, or, or whatever yeah. their weekends are. I know this is, we've gone off on a tangent now, but you've just reminded me of that. Yes, I was told I'll be that. <laughs> what, what did he say to that? I think he said something like, uh, well, that's it. I'm never having a Chinese again. Never having a Chinese <laughs> meal again. <laughs> you can't blame it on the. The chap down the road with the with the restaurant. Oh, I'll be blessed. Uh, yeah, I did read that. Um, but no, I think in in seriousness, because I I know somebody um, 
you know, and the reason why I was having this conversation with Disco yeah. was because you know we both know somebody who who gets the most horrendous abuse on Twitter. Yeah. Now, in fairness, you know, this person could just leave Twitter. Yeah. But um, they have a. Well, why should they though? If they enjoy well, using quite, it. They, quite, but they do have a pretty contentious opinion. Um, uh-huh. So they do have an opinion that does often, you know, cause cause commentary. But in most cases, that commentary is conversational, and you know, I don't agree with you, but but that's it. Um, but you know, the abuse, some of the abuse that comes through, and it's always from accounts that are, yeah. uh, you know, unidentifiable. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, and it's abhorrent yeah you know absolutely abhorrent and uh yeah i i think i would like to see that happen it won't happen of course it won't happen why won't it happen because because it was social media makes money from uh you know from accounts they're not going to suddenly say right we're going to go from having two billion facebook users to only you know what might end up being yeah but does 500 million doesn't this come back to a a slightly larger equivalent of the 1000 true fans thing that you're still going to make money out the people that are intelligent enough to use it and use it properly because the people that are a bit sub you know um i'm trying to think of a polite word and i can't but you know the kind of people i'm talking about they're, they're not the people that spend uh, fill in the gaps no me to fill in the words you're thinking of <laughs> no they're not the they're not the people that spend money on platforms they're only there to cause trouble and they want to cause trouble because it's free yeah so you're not losing not it, anything that's not how the social media works is it they can sell advertising based on the numbers of users so they don't care you know, and, but if the, if the that's, users that's left are a great, greater quality. No, they, it, you know, it, it's it's a numbers game. It's a, uh, and these people will click on ads. They will click on links. They will do this. They will do that. And uh, you know, probably, yeah. I mean, I would like, yeah. I would like the whole kind of thing to be totally overhauled. Some kind of United Nations of social media to to yeah. get involved and uh, you know and deal with it all properly. Well, I can't remember the politician who said this the other day, but he said he's sick to the back teeth of of, of just the, the the fact this lip service. The, the, the social media channels have. And they don't really mean it when they say, no, oh, we'll do don't. something yeah, about it. Of course, we'll, 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 we'll make some action points here. We'll, we've got a plan. No plan. But, uh, oh, there we go. A couple of um, a couple of more serious ones to end the week with. Uh, and that's it for this week. Thank you to our, our guest, Andres Georgiadis, of course, uh, part two of Ask Andres. And as we say, he will be back. He will be back. Uh, if you can share the episode on Twitter or Facebook, you're an absolute star. Let us know where you're sharing to, because we like to give those platforms a shout out to. See you in the Facebook group. Remember, language. Langu- Who used to, what was it? Language Timothy. Do you remember that show, Kev? Language Timothy? Yeah, that was, it? What sorry. was it? Sorry, yes, you're right. Yeah. Ah, um, with Corbett. Um, yeah. Ronnie Corbett. Yeah. Ronnie, Ronnie, Corbett. Ronnie Corbett, yeah. Who was oh, the was mother? Who was the now. mother? Who was the mother? Um, wasn't it uh, Angela Lambert? No. Um. Oh, anyway, answers on a postcard. Um, send your questions and your stories and anything else of interest you think listeners will enjoy or learn via the website address, which is click at Fujicast. Dot co dot uk, uh, or of course you can send it through the the Facebook uh, group. It's it's um it's at the top of the Facebook uh, group again now, yeah, isn't it's it? Yeah, pinned the, announced announced thread. Yes. And, and don't forget, if you want to get ahead of the game, you can uh, you can become a patron and yeah. get your questions answered before anybody else when, when we remember. M- music is some Blue Wednesday supporting music from the incredible Artlist.io, and we will see you next week. Bye bye. The Fujicast is an independent Loading Zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.